Hello there and welcome to my little arty corner here on YouTube. I'm Angela, Angela Porter and it's my pleasure for you to join me in drawing because the purpose of most of my videos is to encourage you to draw with me. Um, at whatever level you wish, taking what inspiration you wish or not, or just listening and watching for whatever reason. Thank you so much for all the lovely comments that have been left. Thank you so much to all my subscribers. I appreciate the subscriptions very much. Um, it's nice to show that what I'm doing is valued, is good enough, and that's nice, and that it helps people. If you haven't subscribed yet, please do. It's cost you nothing and it just shows that little bit of support for the work that I do here. Thank you as well as the lovely comments thank you also for the thumbs up the likes for videos because that gives me feedback on what you do like it doesn't stop me from going outside the box mind you because you know that old saying you can please all of the people all of the time some of the people all of the people some hang on no you can please all of the people some of the time and some of the people all of the time you can't please all of the people all of the time is very true. Very, very true. So what have I got in front of me? I've got my little red sketchbook. I have got multiple sketchbooks on the go. It is my nature. And this one, I've got some pens coming through there and I'll give you a quick look at this one. I have shown you it previously. You'll recognize if you've seen the video where I flipped through this, you'll have seen this. Hang on, let me put the autofocus on. Otherwise, every time I turn over, everybody would be getting seasick. So I've got these done. Still working on that. That one still haven't finished it. We'll get round to it. This one I did do some work with. Um, the colours are more vibrant, but I've forgotten to put the centres in these. But that's no big issue. Um, I want to find, want to try and work out a way of brightening these up somehow because that that just doesn't stand out. The D should be the thing you notice the most. This one. Yeah, we're getting very colourful here with greens and blues and um, purpley colours, pinky purples, which match the background colours of the Distress Ink, but deeper. So there's more work to do on that one. And I'm enjoying that. Be gentle with yourself. I think I've shown you that one. I haven't done any colouring or anything. It's just sitting there. This one, love my flower. Ugh, what possessed me to put embossing powder down? No idea, but I did, and I have to live with it now. A little note there saying, don't. Um, this one I haven't done anything more with. But I love this idea of ripped edges or that, like in yesterday's work, which I most probably don't have to hand. No, I don't think I do. Put it somewhere safe. Um, where I use that organic edge to have something all, um, geometric slid underneath as if we've got layers there and sometimes you can get layers on layers it depends how big the work is this is a monogram d that i've done and i quite like that one it's you now i've got a gym bit of geometric in here and it's sort of like it just feels that it fits in there i don't know why i can't remember why i chose that one or whether i just sort of like felt it and there'll be textural patterns going in there once i add color or decide whether oh this one was a mare Oh, me in colour. I like the colours, I don't like how they look at the moment, but it's a good place for me to experiment and to find things out. Sometimes that's what pages like this and this one are best for. I do love the watery colours and the little water spots on these um, panels, and I love these muted colours as well. I do. And this one is my favourite, where there's... Um, a brown mixed with a sort of like indigo blue or blue, a nice blue colour and it creates something that looks very metallic and that's being left as it is. This one I've done, this one I'm part way through, but again it's that torn edge with that geometric pattern underneath. It could be interesting to have two torn edges with the pattern in between as well. It's all fun. <laughs> oh geometric pattern on the edges for something else in between like a secret garden or a wonderful world so this one still needs some work doing to it <coughs> work in progress now this is interesting you may or may not find this interesting but i was looking on my favorite pen company cult pens online and they're an amazing company of so many different brands 
and I was looking at inks because I thought I want to I want to draw with dip pens again or glass pens because I haven't drawn with them for ages and I wonder what what coloured permanent inks they've got like the the Demet, uh, Documenters black ink but in different colours. Well, they there's a brand called Octopus Ink, which is vegan. It is and it's waterproof, pigmented. You can put it in fountain pens, but it's advised you wash the fountain pen out after use. So that's hence the reason for the dip pen or glass pen. And they had a set of greys with black and white and a set of browns and greens. <gasps> the browns and greens are my kinds of colours. They've got lots of very bright colours in their range, but I got six, two sets of six bottles and they're only tiny little bottles as a try. So some of these I like more than others. But um, I don't know whether the colours are showing up. This green ostrich is lovely. The green crane is sort of like um, quite a muddy, murky kind of green. This grey fox is lovely. It's a lovely bluey colour. The meerkat is nice. The black ink is wonderful. There's a green squirrel, brown seahorse, green tiger. So I grey kangaroo. And yet there's different thicknesses of lines as I try different pens and different ways of drawing out. So that is just test and also I tested the inks by adding I think these are intense watercolours I, I found a set in my stash and used them just to check they are waterproof and blimey they are I'm very happy about that but I'm not going to use them today well I could actually I could but I haven't got used to how they work especially dip pens um, they can be very problematic for me, but I do want to do something on this page. So I'm just going to freehandedly draw a border in with my pencil, because that means if I really get it badly wrong, I can erase it, but that's pretty good. That's good enough. It's just a guide for now, but as I go, I will be adding things to it. Now, what do I want to draw today? I don't think I want that one. I think that's my medium pen. Oh, is it? I can never remember which is which. Yep, yeah, that one's the medium pen. This one's the fine nib. Yeah, I've got three Twisbees. Somebody left a comment about they've also got Twisbees. I've got three, extra fine, fine and medium tips. And I love them, um, which is fantastic. But I'm wary of putting the, the octopus ink in I know the documentus is perfectly fine to be left in the pens for a long period of time and as I use them mostly every day that's fine but the faff of having to clean it out fill it back up and the waste of ink no I'm not doing that environmentally conscious now I've got all these little spots here so I'm going to make use of them to start a pattern oh don't tell me it's, I've been chopsing for too long again right come on there's got to be some yep yeah, I've got some tissue paper here so, well, kitchen roll. Sometimes they need a little bit of a clean and it does help from time to time. Oh, there we go. So I'm going to... Oh, I wonder what this is going to end up as. This looks like it's going to end up like the Tangle Pattern Oysteroid, which I rather like. Now, what I do need to do with this, and I will zoom in, and don't shout at me if I if I move off the screen and forget. I will apologise when I return. But I do want to thicken the lines to the left and the bottom on each one. It gives that feeling that we've got steps going on here. And this random nature of the outside lines is rather fun. Because it do, they do end up looking like oyster shells. So oyster shells can grow in rather bizarre shapes. There's a huge number of oyster shells in the archaeological record in the UK, um, particularly from Roman times, but also from more modern times as well. I think Victorian times because oysters were, re were really cheap and plentiful, in complete contrast to modern times where they are quite expensive and considered a luxury or a delicacy. No, I've never tried one, nor would I ever. Vegetarian. 
So that's my first one, which is quite nice and big. So I'm going to start the next one off somewhere here. And I'll start with one of the, oh, that's got a funny shape in it. And I'll pop a center in when I get to it. Again, just paying attention to the bottom and the left. I'm just going round and not worrying about perfectly copying the shape because the more random it is, the, the better in my book. But I am trying to make the lines closer together towards what is considered the top of the shell, I suppose, because they sort of do get narrower towards one end of them. And, um, and of course, the bigger these um, sections are, the more opportunities they are to put patterns in them. Just about there. So I'll put another one in here. And again, I'm just going to have it as if it's sort of like nestled in and as I add black I can actually adjust the shape and make it more wobbly and wiggly a bit too sharp there but they'll be fine they always work out it doesn't matter I do love these more organic patterns as well so I don't know where I why this one was a thing I wanted to draw. No idea. Perhaps it's because it's so organic that if I'm going to put something geometric in, I've got that nice juxtaposition, the contrast between organic and very structured. Of course, this is great if you find it hard to draw nice smooth lines and get frustrated that you want a smooth line and it's a bit wobbly because that would work perfectly with this. Well, you shouldn't worry about perfectly straight lines. That's what rulers are for. And then you end up with something that doesn't look human almost. When I, I started drawing buildings and things, going out sketching, and I tried drawing them with a ruler, as in putting ruler guidelines in to help me with perspective and so on. Oh, it ended up, not looking right it wasn't me the lines were too straight too perfect too vertical or too horizontal and I like the wibbly wobbly nature of a personal response I suppose the way that my hand works and the, the the way that I see things okay let's have a look here because what I might do I think I know what I'm going to do here I do what I'm going to do is I think I might create a border, an edge of these on this side and then perhaps on the other side I'll have some of the, the geometric pattern going on. How about that? So I've said it before and I'll say it again and again. Part of the process of drawing, of creating art is learning to work out what is you and accepting the part of your art that is you that makes it uniquely yours. You know, there are lots of people doing work similar to what I do. You know, it's not a, it's not a unique style or unique genre or anything like that. But I'd like to think that mine has its own spin, that you can tell when something's my work and when it's not. And, um, and that's just simply because of the way that I draw and the way that I approach things and perhaps my colour palettes at times which can be very bizarre and strange and I'm not very good at that I think I'm going to be sticking very much more to more monochrome colour schemes except for colouring book art we'll see I think it works better for me to be honest you may disagree with me but I really do feel that colour isn't my best best thing in many ways and yet when I use um, when I use monochrome or analogous colour schemes, then I can focus on contrast and highlight as well. OK, so let's get this going down this way.
Analogous colours are colours that are next to each other on the colour wheel. So um, yellow greens, greens, or greens, yellow greens and blue greens would be analogous colours. And they always work well together. They give a very gentle, muted, well not muted necessarily, it depends on how bright you use the colours. But they give a very harmonious palette because they are so similar. So that would be more of mine rather than perhaps pure monochrome which is one colour but I've been known to use just one colour as well. But I'm also quite, um, quite like things like the work of William Morris who I mentioned yesterday I think and um, how his ideals were to bring the beautiful into everyday things. So, you know, anything that you'd use every day from furniture to wallpaper to decorative items, I suppose, and all kinds of things, you know, they need to be beautiful, not just um, functional. And well-made rather than mass-produced shoddiness. So even back in the 1800s there was concern about things like the having things that you love that will last for a lifetime. My grandmother was very much like that. She was born in the late 1800s. I think that she was born in the same year the house I live in was built. And um, fill that in because that looked a bit odd, that little bit left there. And um, she had a dining table that she'd had for decades and decades and it still looked as good as new. It was incredibly solid and sturdy and it was a, a leafed and gated table so if you took the leaves out and put the gates underneath or however they were supported you would have a table at least twice the size and um, it was absolutely gorgeous. It was a lovely deep rich wood as well. I don't know what wood it was. It wasn't mahogany, I don't think. No, it wasn't. It wasn't red enough to be mahogany, but it was absolutely gorgeous. But of course, um, I never got it. I was too young to, when she passed away, to have a say in anything. Though she did want me to have a music cabinet. She had a tall, narrow chest of drawers, and the drawers were quite narrow, and they were meant for keeping music in. So my grandmother trained with Doily Cart, Opera Company, Operetta Company in London as a singer. And she was so chuffed when I became interested in music and so on. Um, she made it well known that she wanted me to have her music cabinet. Well, my mother and aunt had different ideas. It was sort of like, let's sell all of this and see how much we can get for it. So I'm not upset or angry because there's no point in it. It's, you know, it would have been nice to have because it was full of music as well. But um, hey ho, it wasn't meant to be. I used to play cello until I was about 16, 17. And I had a music teacher and I who disagreed with music. And, I was, and it was all very... Um, weird sort of like very modern music that I did not like I did not enjoy playing and yet there was another syllabus for the exam that had more of the music I would like but that wasn't her kind of music and so it put me off so much that I no longer wanted to play the cello but I still sang with choirs and um, absolutely love singing but unfortunately I've damaged my vocal cords in a fit of coughing before it was worked out that I have asthma or it might be the asthma medication but hopefully things will improve with time I can only but hope but I still have a great love of music and I've taught myself to play the flute over the years there's a story behind that and um, I've got an electric folk harp here, which I haven't practiced for quite a few years. 
and every now and again I remember I've got it I think I need to do that and it goes by the by so perhaps now isn't quite the time for me yeah I taught myself to play the flute oh and I had piano lessons as well and I used to play in not just the school orchestra but the Mick Morgan youth as well and at one time I actually wanted to be a musician but I didn't think I had the the qualities or the skill or the feeling for it that it seemed you needed I most probably did I mean there's a reason why I now understand myself a bit better I think but um, I also had a great love of science chemistry in particular and so I chose to study chemistry and physics and geography at A-level, which are sort of like the exams we have here in the United Kingdom before you go on to university to study for a degree. And um, my music teacher was very upset, so perhaps I wasn't, you know, I just didn't have the confidence in me. And I played fine and well, as long as nobody could either hear me individually or see me. So I had to be on an inside desk in an orchestra or in the back row of a choir. Um, otherwise, I'd just, my self-confidence or my, you know, feeling, my lack of self-confidence and feeling very self-conscious would get in the way of me performing well. I'd just go to pieces. But if you couldn't see me, I was fine. And if I wasn't the only one of that instrument, I'd be fine as well. So, I still love music. I asked um, Google to play my favourite favourites playlist on Spotify while I was having a bath and sorting myself out earlier this morning. Well, it's afternoon now, but you know what I mean. And um, the first song that came up was um, Dies Irae from Verdi's Requiem, I think it is absolutely fantastic music so powerful and yes I've sung it and it's amazing with full orchestra and a choir in full voice and working together it's like flying on the back of a dragon it's amazing and um, straight after it was um, what was it I think it was Guns N' Roses Sweet Child of Mine I've got eclectic tastes I like something I like it it's not so much the genre of music though there are some genres that I'm not particularly keen on doesn't mean I dislike everything it's it's just that most of it I just don't like it it's just a you know it just isn't my thing it doesn't mean it's bad you know that what I like is any better it is what it is so I've got this here, this Oysteroid. So let me zoom out so you can see the whole page. And I've got gaps on this side, but I think I know what I want to do with those. So what I'm going to do here, I think I'll put another repeat in this one. So I've got this just going outside the edge, like so. Which is something nice so that gives me that little corner there and I'll just draw all the way up here now do I want to fill do you know what I'm going to leave it as it is have a look I'm going to leave it as it is apart from I think I might put another one in just here so if I move this up able to see what I'm doing. Now there's no way you'd ever be able to copy the shapes I've used exactly so however yours ends up just embrace it. It's yours, not mine, it's yours. It's your art, it's your creation, it's your work and be proud of it. And with practice skills you'd like to improve on will improve. You'll gain more confidence, you'll be more prepared to try different things out on your own 
and just allow your instincts to take over as to when something is finished or not. Like here, I stood back and I thought, no, I want this to just spill out a little bit more at the bottom so it feels a bit more stable there. Because the, the, the top is quite narrow, so it's almost like a pile of oyster shells in a way. Very, very strong lines here today from me. Remember the little wobbles you put in? So if you accidentally make a wobble, it looks so deliberate. It looks deliberate as part of what we're drawing. Little one there. So that's already looking nice. And I think I've got an idea what I'd like to do over here. I think I'll just adjust that line a little bit. Now I could round the lines where they touch, but I'm not going to because that will take away from the order orderly nature of these. So on this side over here, just pop my, I just probably don't need that, I could do, because I've been using water on pages. They're getting, you know, they tend to um, cockle a bit or, you know, bend and wobble a bit. But I'm going to put here a grid. And again, if my grid wobbles, if it's not perfectly The lines aren't perfectly parallel or the same distance apart. I am not going to get stressed and upset by it. So I've done that. Let me just pop this on here just in case that's still a bit damp because I did use quite a lot of paper. Paper? Ink. So now I'm going to start drawing the horizontal lines in. And I'm doing this with pencil. I am going to ink these lines in today. So if you prefer to draw them straight in pen, please do. I just feel the need to use a pencil today. It is Monday after all. And it's lovely and coolish here. It's still, you know, there's warmth. Um, the computer's not telling me what temperature it is. Oh, I'm going to have half a box at the bottom again, but I'm fine with that. Part of me thinks I should have really started at the bottom and worked up, but it'll be fine. So again, I'm going to use the same pen I did for the other side. This one actually might be the medium by the thickness. I'm going to put my bounding lines in. And I may just adjust some of these lines in thickness so I get rid of the, um, the one at the bottom or redraw the horizontal lines from the bottom up. That might be a better idea, actually. So if I put the vertical ones in. And you can see the even these are wobbling today. That one can go there. This one can go there. And that one can go there very good there. What I am going to do is I'm going to give this a moment to dry and then I'm going to erase those pencil lines. Now I know I have an eraser here. I do. Not one that makes um, dust but I've got this cute little thing to pick up the dust. Like a car, a little mini cleaner car. It's from Midori. Bought it in cult pens because I they had them on offer and I couldn't resist and it actually really does work. Japanese. Japanese stationery is fantastic, I do have to say that. So this should have dried, or mostly. Got a bit of a smear there, but it'll be fine because we're going to draw things in. Just take that off again so I can just get this done. Okay, and we'll start at the bottom with the, the lines. There we go. So again, using the same pen. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to start at the bottom and if I get a partial square at the top, so be it. Yeah, I know I could sort of like roughly gauge where the centre is and split the centre into halves and so on, but I could end up with things that aren't squarish. Because it is squarish here. We're not drawing perfect squares. I've got wobbly lines. And uh, uneven distances. 
you have a look at medieval manuscripts, they're absolutely beautiful. But when you look closely, you see that their patterns, the geometric patterns they use, which are called diapers, often aren't perfectly, perfectly perfect either, because they were drawn by hand. So I'm going to split these. And yes, I know I've got a pen line there, but I think I'll get that to disappear. So we've got this. Something will go here, I promise. But I've got this going on here. Now I'm going to start at the top and work my way down because I'm less likely to smudge things. And I'm going to use one of my, my fragments. I'm so tempted to do this one. I don't know if you can see it, that one, because I rather like that one. But I think I may try to do this one. Shall I? I do like that one though. Actually that one I will do. Right, so let's move that. So I'm going to start with, I'm going to put that there so I know where I'm looking at. We're going to start with, come on, see that little splotch in the corner just disappeared with this. Okay, then I'm going to draw in four leaves in the middle or four petals and then I'm going to draw lines down like this so it's sort of like an arrowhead underneath each petal and they don't have to be perfectly identical because the lines that go underneath the um, the petals have no bearing on how these patterns join next door. Now you can't rotate a mirror or reflect or whatever this pattern. What I will try and do is to make sure that the petals meet where they join on. So crossed lines, four petals, arrowhead or the diagonal lines that sort of go about a third to halfway down the petal. In fact, I think I could have used a finer pen here to do this, but hey-ho, we're going to have bold lines today. There's just something lovely and soothing about the repetition of a pattern. And even though it looks like there may be a lot, of repetition there's a big space here to fill in don't let it make you feel overwhelmed by the task or think it's going to take a long time because that can happen to me when I see the amount of things I've got to do you know if I haven't gone in and rounded all the corners as I work or I've had to go back and find where I've missed out little bits of ink you think it's going to take you forever, but it never does. It takes a lot less time than you think. So there is where we get that corner. So we're getting sort of star shapes going on here. This I hope will disappear. If not, um, I'll use try and use a dark background colour, I think, so that it will disappear. In that I didn't quite line that up with that particular petal but it'll be fine the grand scheme of things it'll be fine so it's going to go down oh look it did it disappeared yay good job Angela oops there we go now you could do all of these in steps so you could do all the crosses and all the squares as you go I find that very tedious and boring, but that's me. Now this one, I've done a corner like this before, so I know I need to put two lines on the outside edge. So I'm going to draw a petal, a leaf shape in here. Go back this way, do this one this way. Top and bottom. And if I 
I haven't quite managed to get the petal to touch the outer line then I just add a little bit of ink there just to disguise it nobody will know the difference so another way of doing this is to look at putting lines on either side of the diagonals to split that space up it works the same way um, it's whatever you find easiest to work with whatever makes the most sense to you in fact that seems to be an easier way of creating this rather than saying an arrowhead behind the petal but it works either way so do that just like that works exactly the same some of these will look a bit patchy in the middle because we've got almost like a starburst where all of these lines join just go back and tidy it up and give it an, a neater rounder shape it's fine everything's good it's all fine and all well And don't be afraid to use a pencil to draw the grid in before you ink in. I'm glad I did because I had the opportunity then to change what I was going to do. We'll get a tiny bit there. Wish I hadn't, but there we are. A little bit there as well. It carries on the pattern so it looks like it belongs in again. Just going to add a bit of ink there just to create a, that circle in the middle. So I shall go along this and put all of these diagonal lines in, fill that tiny little space in and just change the shape of that oysteroid there just on the edge that little bit. Remember these little dots around here are actually the ink from the other side of the paper and sometimes it's nice to go across the row and to do the same thing one after the other because your pen and your hand and muscle memory will be working together for so many steps so I'm just popping in my leaf shapes here but I'm doing them top and bottom and then side to side some of mine are getting a bit curved at the end rather than pointier and either way works this I think I would still do this around each one because if I'm going in that clockwise or anti-clockwise motion then I know I'll get every section whereas if I'm going in the same section right the way across I can get confused quite easily with me yeah just tidying those little circular areas up that will need a bit of tidying as will that just giving that dark spot excuse me while i shuffle myself Ooh. okay carrying on and i said shuffle myself not like a set of playing cards as in shuffle myself on my seat to get more comfortable it's beginning to get uncomfortable so so I'm going to do the rest of this, some of the rest of it. Actually, I'll put all of the cross areas in and I can see that I can actually draw them in one go almost by going diagonally through the boxes. And then I can come back and do the same this kind of way and I will fill that little bit in there and then that means you're not stopping and starting all the time that's an interesting section because there's only going to be part of a petal in there but it will work and of course the, um, the corner bits this one would come down to there
Again, this is strange little shape here, so I'll just thicken the bottom of this oysteroid just to make that strange shape go away. Okay, we've got something strange going on here, so I'll just thicken this and just fill the rest of it in, and that'll be fine. That little bit at the bottom, well, we'll see what we do with that. So that's the basics of the first, that's the first part of the pattern. The next, next step, shall we have a quiz? Yes, that's right, we're going to draw the four petals in. I'm going to do it like this. So I'm going to do it in columns and then I'll do the rows because this, it always feels like things go quicker when you do it this way. No idea why, but it always does. You're doing the same amount of work either way it's because you fill a larger space and you think, phew, I haven't got so much left to go. And it's quite encouraging. But when you're using a new pattern, and this one was new to me, I've got no idea if it's a tangle pattern anywhere. I'm sure somebody else must have come up with it, either recently or in antiquity, and it's fine. Because in the realms of patterns, there can't be many things that are entirely new under the sun. So I'm looking here for where I've got some vertical ones that will fit in. None there, there. Those will be missing. This one will be visible, but none of the others will. Um, actually, that one will a little bit there. OK, so now we're going to go across. So hopefully my hand won't get too much in the way. might turn my book around so I can do this in a more natural hand position. That's better, so hopefully you can see what I'm doing. Let me just move my mouse and other things out the way, and I'll try and get my hand out the way for you. Oh, this one has one of those under there. There we go. So, This doesn't feel to go quite so quickly because we're having to go, we're only doing a small number of them and we're you know, in one direction. It's all an illusion though. In fact, according to science, time is an illusion. It's a construct of, of the human mind, which is a very bizarre thing to say, but it seems to be so. It's how we understand the world and perceive things. So there we are, we've got all of that done. So the next step, do you remember? Yeah. It's the splitting these corners into three so I am going to go sort of like in half rows try and make sure the ink there doesn't get or you know isn't entirely trapped or you know not trapped what am I trying to say I'm finding it hard to talk and draw so that the ink the ink the lines connect straight and curved, so we don't have any gaps there. That's really important for me if I'm going to do tradigital art, because in tradigital art, you do the drawing traditionally with paper, and then you add colour and texture and pattern, you know, sometimes pattern, but texture and colour, highlight and shadow digitally. 
so you get the best of both worlds, which is what I tend to do if I can. Uh, that's right. And I have much better luck with colours digitally than I do here. I think I have to learn to take a small number of colours out of my palette and um, just work with those, you know, whichever, of, you know, whichever palette I'm using, whichever set of materials I'm using, and stick to those colours and make it coherent, cohesive. Like everything belongs together. So I'm nearly done with all of this. It's grey skies here today. And there are some white puffy clouds there. I think we've got rain forecast for tomorrow, which will be a blessing, I'm sure, for the earth. We haven't had much in the way of rain this month and uh, I'm sure that nature needs it. Just hope it's not heavy downpours that just run off the dry, hard soil, which doesn't get in very much to help with plants and nature. But tomorrow will tell, no doubt. works. Get into the bottom now. It's nearly done. I don't know how long it's taken me to do this, but what's it? 46 minutes for all of this so far. And a bit of a blather. A quick look through this sketchbook so you can see what I've been up to over the past couple of weeks, three weeks or so, I guess. I don't know. Come on, there, got you. And that's my pattern here. So I'm just looking for any places that look a bit odd. So I'm going to go where all these lines meet and just make sure that I've got a nice neat sort of circle-ish shape there because obviously I haven't got all the spacing exactly correct on them but we can make it look like the lines are all converging to one spot the world is quite quiet today there's no birds shouting and hollering at the moment as they have been. Oh, there's a couple. Somebody's let their dog out the back. It's barking. It's a little yappy thing. Very yappy. All it does when it goes out is bark. So there we are. There's that done. Now on this side, I'll, I'm going to put in some random lines. Now I'm tempted to put them in as they've got borders or edges which will work fine I'm sure and you know they're going to be filled with pattern once I've added colour here I'm going to pop one in there and that's it then I think this is a big space at the top so I think I might put a little border there and perhaps a little one that separates those sections that feels better I'll put a little bit there just to suggest that this carries on all the way down so before I do anything else I am going to put my initial can't fit my initials in anywhere there can I I'd like to, I like to hang or put my initials somewhere no, nope, wrong one. I want the fine one. I do think fine lines would have been better for this, for the inner pattern here, but perhaps I'll just sneak one in here. A little, little pebble in. Fill it with my initials like that. I'll sign this as well. 
even though this won't be finished today, um, at least I know when I drew it. So that has become quite nice. Okie doke. So I'll start adding some colour. The question is, what material do I use? I'm going to go with ink tents. So I'm going to get my ink tents pencils or my colour chart. Here's the colour chart. Yep, I swatched all of them. I've got the whole hundred colours, including this year's. Um, I've had the 76 set for a number of years. I will be needing to order a new red oxide soon, which is my absolute favourite. I'm looking here, I'm wondering what colour would I like to do this in? I think the oysters I'd like to do in a sea-like, well, actually a peachy colour would be quite nice. So I'm looking here to see. That's scarlet pink, perhaps? That would be quite nice. So I should go hunting in here for scarlet pink, which I think that's scarlet pink. That's carmine pink, hot red, cherry, crimson, scarlet pink. There we are. And then I'd like a colour that either tones with that or is different for the other side. I'm tempted to go with mustard. No, it's perhaps a bit brownie. It's not that brownie though. got this colour. This is the colour I've got. So I'm looking for something that would work nicely over here or looking for a colour I could use on the whole lot. Amber's nice. Fern is one of my favourite greens, though that leaf green is a bit on the muckier side, which could be interesting. I think we'll go with leaf green. Actually, yeah, so scarlet pink can go back is there. Leaf green will be round here somewhere. It's not there, is it? No, it's field green. Light olive, light green, spring green. Where's the felt green? Not felt green, the leaf green. Oh, right, it should be up here, but it's, it doesn't, see, oh, doesn't seem to be. Oh dear. So where have I put that? I've put that somewhere where it doesn't belong. Oh, gutted. Right, okay. Rethink. Um, what's that one? That's fern. I'll use fern. I've no idea where I've put that leaf green. I know I've got it. I could be trying to look for it so hard I can't actually see it. I'm going to give this a bit of a sharpen before I start. I don't know if I've done with that. It'll turn up. It always does. I'll look and I'll go, oh, I put it there, did I? And I've got some water here. And I've got, um, I need a paintbrush. I want one that will be, yeah. Let me have a look. What size do I want? Glasses off so I can see my range of pens. Not pens brushes. Four. Oh, hang on, I've got a two. Oh, it's a two, yeah, that'll be nice. Got one of my favourite brushes here. Yes, I know I could use a water brush, but I don't want to. I actually might go and get another green in a moment, or a bluey green. I'm just going to add some of this fern green. It's not there here. So I'm adding the colour where I want it to be darkest. And then just bringing it down. I want to have the darkness underneath the um, section. So I'll do a couple of these and then we'll have a look at how I'm going to... Oh, that's nice. That is a nice green. Just love how quickly the ink tents react with water and how much more vibrant they are when you do activate them. 
don't forget I will want to, I probably will want to come back and add some pattern into these sections as well some of them so this is this may be more of a background color than anything else I'll do the same over here activate the dark areas and then just pull a tiny amount out elsewhere That actually works quite nicely. Right, I'm going to look for a different green. Let's have a look. Let's see what we want. Ooh. Actually, I've got some here. I was doing some work with something last night, so I kept the pencils I was using out. Let me put... I've got the mustard here. That could be quite nice. Because that mustard and green will work nicely together. But I also have here somewhere, there's more, I don't want more, I've got sepia, with indigo, that must be the sepia, yes, because sepia ink is over here, actually, but this green, I'm looking, we got a grey that's a greyish green, not really, so I'll stick with the sepia. And we'll see how it looks. Oops, just throwing your pencils on the floor, it's fine. So let's have a look at how the mustard fits with this. And again, I'm going to, oh, I think it'll be fine because it's the yellowy colour and greeny yellow are analogous colours, so they'll work nicely together. It's just me doubting myself. using a different pet brush here. I picked a bigger brush up. Luckily I've bought some new brushes. These are... I'll keep them because you, with rec brushes you can get plenty of texture into things. So, that's nice. Actually that works nicely. I like that. I'm just checking because the, the mustard at the end looks green. You can see when it goes on the paper, it turns to this yellowy colour with that hint of brown. It's a nice warm colour as well. Green's quite a nice warm colour. So my brush isn't dripping with water. It's, it's damp enough. Um, but without it dripping with water, I feel I've got more control over how I can spread the colour and where it goes. And also it means that I'm less likely to damage the paper I'm working on. That actually works quite nicely. Now on the screen, the colours look more insipid than they do to my eyes. So let me have a look. I've got sepia ink. I'll come back with that in a moment. Let me just do another one of these. Now I'd like to have green next to the mustard and so on. So these may have a different pattern of colour in them. And with this one, I'm adding a lot more colour than with the previous one. So let's go here. And then here as well. And let's see how that looks. That's better. Might be a little brush, but and you know, I have to work quite hard in the larger sections with it, but I'm quite happy to do that, to be honest, because uh, brush fits in the, in the small spaces so much easier than that other one. These are, my, these are some of my favourite brushes, though the new ones I've got are a different brand. These are Pro Art, and it's a Series 107 spotter. They've got short, short hair bristles on them, they're synthetic. I don't do anything with animal hair and um, but they've got they're quite stiff and bounce bouncy but quite stiff so they I've got a lot more con easy control over these than I would have with a softer less springy brush and I like the way that they they will carry a fair amount of water in them but they don't remain wet because I gather that with animal hair brushes they can get waterlogged at times, you know, because they, they pick up a lot of water. 
I guess it depends what kind of art you do, what you need different brushes for. The ones I've bought are synthetic, synthetic squirrel or something like that. Yeah, synthetic, they're not real and they're really nice. They've got the Nick Pro brand, which I've not come across and they were really not that expensive for a set, which I was doubtful about them, but they're actually really nice. I was using them yesterday. And a big range of sizes in there, so I know I can most probably, you know, if I ever need any in the future, then I can get them. So that's the mustard. Oh, it's the bigger brush. I'll pop that back. So I'm only using the same size. You see, I've added a lot more colour to this one because sometimes it's better to add a little bit to see what things look like and then decide to darken it afterwards, which is what I'm going to do with that first one. Because once it's dry, I can go back and add the ink tents on the top. And ink tense pencils are permanent when they dry. You can use them as pencils, but they really shine when you activate them with water. Their real bright colours come out. And they are a lot like ink. Say they, they dry permanent as well. So working in layers is fab with them because you um, you can layer so easily and keep highlights and so on. I'll add some more of the mustard here. Perhaps a little bit more down here because that would be, I think, a, a bit more in shadow in places. Okay, I've got the green, so I'll come back with some more of the green as well. What I would do, rather than doing these one at a time normally, is I'd add colour to them all and then come back with a brush probably because I'm only using these two colours so there's no reason why I need to do each one separately as it were. Anyway, just needed a bit more water. My brush had become quite dry by the time I got here. You can see how much of a difference that makes. It's, you know, it's I haven't put that much more um, colour down, but it's just working. Go back and do the mustard parts now. So I'm starting just on the edge of the mustard, just to start activating it. But then I'll work backwards before that little bit dries, so that we can push the colour backwards as well and keep that quite intense up here. And here I'll just need to add perhaps a little bit extra water just to blend that out. So this one's the same, I'm just going to add water there. I'm not going to add much anywhere else for the colour. I want to keep it mainly towards the edges where the highlights would be, or where the shadows would be. Now then. What I'm also going to do is, I've got this sepia ink and I want a finer, finer brush. It's my fine brush, finer one. This one, this is a De La Rowney Aquafine, it's at the zero size. The other one I was using was the Pro Arts, which was a size two. And I'm just picking some of this sepia up from the pencil tip. And then I'll just use that just to add some shadows. So I've just put little dots of that colour down. They won't dry too quickly and I can just spread it out just to give a bit more intensity in places like so. Which I think will be lovely. And I can just push it back just a little bit and you can see the difference. It's very subtle, but there is a difference with this one and the previous one, the one above it. So it is subtle because I like to blend my shadows out. I don't like harsh lines with them. 
but there is more of a shadow there which is really nice and I think the sepia is working well because it's a cooler colour and that means you know cooler colours tend to push things further back they look further away generally so a little more shadowy so and because the colours are underneath still um, that colour will show through so we're just adding sepia to the green really and just adding that little hint of shadow and shade where these overlap and what I'll do afterwards is probably is I'm going to come back and just bring some shadow a bit more of this underneath these areas where we've got these parts being thicker yeah, underneath the thicker part of the, the line here just to add some shadows under there as it will work and I like these De La Rowney brushes because again they're quite s springy and stiff so they they tend to bounce back into shape easily when you release the pressure or they're more controllable so hopefully you can see what's going on there okay so I'm going to pop these to one side for a moment and I'm going to look at this and let's see what we can do with this I'll just pick one and I'm going to put mustard in the middle of the design in these little leaf shapes well they're going to be petals now aren't they golden petals because this color is quite golden i suppose so i'm just going to do the same thing i've done previously activate just at the edge pull what little color out there is and then push the rest of the color back to the middle so we're having the darker colour in the middle and it's fading out towards the edge of the petal. Every now and again I'm just going to rinse my pencil if the faded part is getting too dark. Pencil, my brush. Oh, blimey. I think it must be dinner time. <laughs> So we've got those little flowers there. Then I think I'm going to turn these bits here into leaves. Now have I got one that's dry where these ones at the bottom are. So I'm going to put green at the base of these. A fair amount. And I will come back with some with sepia afterwards. I'm not going to put the sepia down now because if you it's quite dark dark a dark colour and I only want the barest hint of it to add that shadow and shade. So I'm just touching the edge of these green areas and just spreading the colour back down. So we've got those going on. And then I've got these areas around here. These sort of like um Oh, what, what do we call them? Oh, now pencils fall on the floor. Luckily one of them is one of the colour I'm going for, which is my red oxide. I'm definitely going to have to buy, well, I will have to buy a new one eventually. This is one of the shortest of the Inktense pencils. Shows you how much I like it. But I think a touch of rust, a touch of ready brown, will actually work quite nicely in these sections. So let's have a look. So I'm putting the red oxide at the base of each of these 
almost diamond shapes in between these and just around the, the petal -y bits okay um, yeah like that I think carefully here because I haven't put the leaves in so I'm being conscious of where my leaves will be and where the oxidey bits will be just a little bit under there and here okay and just do this bit here and these ones here And let's just start adding some water to this. I know I've gone over an hour, but oh gosh, well over an hour. But it gives a start to all of this, right? You don't need so much water on this brush. Yes, that's that's the way it's gonna go. So I'm activating the red oxide and then just blending it into the middle so I'm getting a highlight there. And I can intensify that highlight. I was more confident with a brush, I could put gold paint in these or in the gold paint in the petals would be glorious, wouldn't it? Still possible to do. Doesn't mean I can't do it now. In fact, having an underpainting of colour would help if the metallic ink or um, paint or gouache um, was a bit patchy. Should have something underneath it. And with metallic ink, this colour will show through anyway. Depending on the type of ink or paint you use. If you use metallic watercolours, then they tend to be slightly translucent. They'll show the colour underneath. I quite like that. It brings everything, gives everything a kind of earthy kind of feel. Don't know if you agree. So this is quite like the land. And now I'm starting to think, hmm, perhaps I ought to do blues over here. Sea, sea like colours. So I think that would work quite nicely, if you ask me. Land and sea, where they meet. Makes sense. So I've got some there. And again, I can actually go back and darken those or by adding more colour. Use the sepia to add more shading. But I just think this will work really quite nicely. Add some more green to some leaves so we can see what it looks like. These are the quickest part to do, really. And the lovely thing about ink tents is that you don't have to be too neat and tidy as you add the pencil, because you're going to wet it and move it about. You can even out any in, any imperfections or unevenness quite easily. Oh, look, I've missed one out there, the red oxide. How many of you spotted it before I did? Yeah, all of you? Yeah. Not a problem. Go back there. And also I'll need to put some the green in here. So there we've got that going on. I'll just do this one there. Just so that this is consistent. And that is what the colours will look like. I am very, very tempted to do blue over here because these do look like wavy patterns, don't they? So let's have a look at the blue I would like. I'd like a muted a muted blue. I don't want anything that's too bright. And that's the problem with ink tents because they all tend to be deep indigo is too dark. 
Sea blue's nice, but I'm looking over here. Sea breeze is nice, but that denim, that pale denim, perhaps like the dark um, cerulean. So hard. I think the dark cerulean and the sea breeze would be lovely. So, and I can do those in alternating bands or mix them as well. But let's have a look. Dark cerulean. The problem with my pencil holder is you can't see the names of these all that easily. And Sea Breeze was the other one I wanted. There we go. So a bluey green and a blue. So let's just add some here. And with these, I think I'm going to put the colour the darkest at the base of each of these. Wave-like. And I know I've got some metallic, you know, iridescent watercolour paints. And I may use those in those sections in between. So let's have a look at this and see how this will work, shall we? So I want to have the darkest at the bottom and the lightest areas at the top. I may have to just... Oh gosh, that was way too much water. Pick some up. While it's wet, I'm just going to try and even this out a little bit so we're getting that gradient there. I've overspilled into that little white section, but I'm not too worried. And then I've got the sea breeze. I haven't used this one at all yet, so. I'm not going to try and sharpen it with that sticker on, and I'm not going to be a pain when we move that sticker. There, that's lovely. This will work much better, this one, I think. So I'm just stroking all the colour back down to the bottom. And then I'll just use a bit of water just to smooth it out and make sure I get into all the nooks and crannies here. That will actually look quite nice. It's not a bad choice, really, for me. Bit bright in contrast, wish I hadn't used the iron oxide now, but I can always do those those parts in gold and cover it over. And that'll be quite nice then. So let me have a look. So that'll be blue, green, blue, green. So let's just put some of this down here next to this one so we can see what it looks like. Of course, I can always use a, a more muted colour or a, a more new, um less saturated colour over the top like sepia or something else just to tone these down or Payne's grey perhaps just to desaturate so I'm just going to go back and forth here just moving the colour down to the bottom where it's going to be darkest and then just going to bring some of that colour upwards and create a nice kind of gradient so that we've got some colour there. So I think that's going to work in a weird way. Okay, right, these are now nice and dry. So I've kept you here for so long, so I might as well carry on a little bit. I do want to put some patterns in these sections. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to choose some sections like this and I'm going to use some of the favourite kinds of filler patterns from the Zentangle world, I think, and some of the ones that have been inspired by Rebecca Blair, or just simple textural patterns. So here I'm using good old perk. And I quite like that I've got these beads there because this is a perfect opportunity again for using something to bring these out as beads, so highlights and shadows. But I need to draw this, this part in before I do that. The advantage of putting the pen on top of the ink tents once it's dry 
is that the paint isn't going to dull the pen and you have to go over the lines. There might be a little bit of it here and there, but it's not wholesale. So I prefer to do work this way. But my mind is saying here, Angela, perhaps you always ought to draw the basic outline in pencil and then ink in afterwards. I'm thinking, oh, that's a recipe for disaster. Because if I miss if I miss the line, I want to put my pen in, you know, the colour and the pen. You know what I mean? Outlining the parts and pen. Then it could end up as a whole absolute disaster for me. So I've got some interesting things going on here. This one, I think I might just put lines that curve with how I would see the, the oyster, this level of the oyster curve, curving, curving. Just like that. Now, whether I do this on every oyster shell, I don't think so, because I think I'd like some variation, but I might limit myself to a small number of textural patterns to keep them coherent. So that's kind of working. That gives, and especially if I was to make the dots at the bottom that bit bigger, that adds more ink at the bottom, which suggests bending downwards and a bit more shadow at the bottom as well. Maybe that I'm getting up here and we're going to complete blobs, which is fine. But that kind of works. That lends some weight there. The top here, I think I'm just going to put like a crack in it, as if it's a rock that's cracked, perhaps. Around the edge, I am going to add a little aura in. Times like this, I wish I had a super, super extra, extra fine fountain pen. I don't. And that just gives me space to decide what I'm going to do elsewhere. And part of me just wants to go like this. I'm just going to fill this in with black there. A continuation of the shadowing, which will be fine. Shadows flowing into the cracks. Spaces between. Um. So, I'm just going to put the black bottoms in these. In weather space, I'm going to put more than one repeat inside, a border or a whatever you want to call it. The hint of this in the other sections it means your brain goes, Oh, it's got to have the same pattern over there, then. Yep, it has. There we go. So that is that one oyster shell, which has gone from being dull and boring to rather ornate. This one, I am tempted to put fine lines in to make this look a bit more like a leaf. So perhaps halfway up ish. Oh, didn't quite make it on that one, but it's fine. There's going to be errors and mistakes. It's not going to be perfect because it's Angela drawn and I'm human, which means I'm imperfect. So. 
there we go that actually adds a bit more interest to that and these sections here I think I'm going to eventually add lines like this for now just to take that brown colour away because I think I did make a mistake here um, I should have waited until I decided on the colours over here, over there because I could have made use of them in this section as well but that earthy colour actually does suggest we've got we're being liminal in our design here liminality is where it's an edge between one one place and another one time and another one experience and another um, one environment and another so an example of a liminal space would perhaps be um, at the beach where you stand at the edge of the tide and we're there between land and sea and that that space there is liminal because it's the space between them you think about that in life in terms of life our lives then we have very many liminal moments in our lives so there we have it that is my work today there's my three pens i'll pop all the ink tense pencils here i've used i'm not going to try and get the names up right but i will put a list of them in the description brushes and my pencil which will stop everything from rolling off and it's time for me to say goodbye and to thank you all for sticking with me in this daftly long video but I did want to show you the things that I'm thinking about over here I'm thinking about quite simple textures and I may use um, a metallic ink or metallic gold or something like that or to do those patterns except I'm going to need a very very steady hand and a very very fine paintbrush so I may not do that but then if I did that it'd be out of keeping with everything else so perhaps I'll use black perhaps I'll find a very fine um, pigma or unipin or similar but I hope you've enjoyed this one I hope you'll give it a go it is quite big because it's A5 in size it's an A5 you know um, sketchbook which is about half US letter size A4 and A5 uh, you know A4 and letter size aren't exactly the same so this is A4 in size letter would be a bit longer and a little bit narrower but they're, they're close enough so half an eight half a letter sized sheet of paper but I think it'll work out fine I'll eventually work out what I'm going to do with this this lot here you can see I've missed adding detail there but I can go back and do that after um, so take care be gentle be kind to yourself be gentle with yourself be kind to yourself and find time to be creative and I'll see you again in my next video. Bye bye for now. Bye.